Hi, folks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, I am working on letting people in from the waiting room, and I'm going to get interpretation set up here. Um, and then I will share my screen, and um, you can see the opening prompt we have for this meeting. So let me just get interpretation set up here first. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, Catherine. You're going first, right? Yes. yes. Great. Hi. Thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, and I'm just going to ask folks if you could please mute yourself um, while you're not talking, just to reduce background noise. That would be great. Okay, and I am starting interpretation. Um, everybody will need to choose either the English or the Spanish language channel in order to hear everything that is said in the meeting. Um, and Emily, I, I can see you, so I'm going to ask you this question, Emily Chiara. Um, who from your group should I share uh, screen sharing abilities with? Um, with Zhu Pong and I. Um, okay. Unfortunately, it's not going to be able to join us today. Okay, no problem. All right, thank you. I'll do that. Okay, here we go. Just letting folks in. And then I think Sue, I need to make co host so she can let people in too. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Okay, so um, as you're coming in, please note that you will need to choose either the English or the Spanish language channel um, for interpretation. If you don't choose one or the other, you'll be able to hear, I think, people who are hosts talking, but you might not be able to hear everything that's said in the meeting. Um, and also, as you're coming in, using your native language, could you please type in the chat to tell us how you identify your role in the food system? And recognizing that maybe not everybody has an official role in the food system, you know, maybe you don't have a profession in the food system, but everybody eats. So if, if the only thing you can come up with is eater, that's fine. Advocate, um, educator, you know, whatever you, however you would describe your role in the food system, please type that in the chat. We've just still got folks coming in, so I'm just going to wait a couple, another minute or two before we get started in, er in earnest here. Um, we've got a big group today, which is really exciting, so I'm really appreciative of everyone for being here. All right, let me see what we've got in the chat here. Looks like we've got food coordinator, eater, farmland preservation, consumer, volunteer, gardener, eater, town counselor, consumer advocate. Nice. <laughs> Award manager for the Mass Up project. That's great. CSA member. Okay, awesome. Lots of great answers here. Definitely encourage folks to check out the chat, see who else is in the room with you. And um, we've got, like I said, we've got a lot of folks here today. So I'm really, really excited to have this group here. Um, and it looks like the waiting room traffic is starting to trickle a little bit more. So um, Sue, if you can just keep letting people in as I get us started, that's that would be very helpful. Um, and I will kick us off here. Hey, uh, Caitlin. Yeah, Nathan. I think uh, Catherine was checking with you whether you, you can hear her. And oh, I cannot hear Catherine. Um, and it might be, you know what? Let me just. It's because I have not done what I told everybody else to do and chosen a language channel, and that is why. Catherine, um, can you speak on the English channel now? Yes, now I can hear you.
No, so there's nobody there yet. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, I think that's fine, Catherine, if you wouldn't mind just continuing to interpret on that channel. Um, and as folks come in, if they need it, then it's there for them. How does that sound? Catherine? Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So let me go back to my presentation here. All right, so thank you everyone for sharing a little bit more about yourself. Um, oh, and sorry, and I'm not actually sharing my screen, I think. Let me get this figured out. Okay, so this is Transforming White Supremacy in the Hampshire County Food System, Moving Toward Shared Power. It's a big topic. We have some great speakers today. I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, our speakers today include me and I'm Caitlin Marquis from Healthy Hampshire. Um, and for those who don't know, Healthy Hampshire is an initiative located at the Collaborative for Educational Services. And we focus on access to healthy food and opportunities for physical activity, um, specifically through policy systems and environmental change. We'll also be hearing from Yep, go ahead, Catherine. Okay, I'll slow down, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Um, we also will hear from Kia Aoki, who is a member and the, the liaison for the Food Policy Council Governance Circle, which I'll tell you a little bit more, and she'll tell you a little bit more about in a bit. We'll hear from Amy Francis, who is the co-owner, I believe, of Belly of the Beast, in, uh, which is an eatery in Northampton. And we'll hear from, it sounds like, just Emily Kiara and Jupong Lin from Common Share Food Co-op in uh, Amherst, or the Emerging Common Share Food Co-op. Right. Common Share Food Co-op. Okay, and just to cover the agenda for today's session, we are doing the welcome right now. Thanks for coming in. If anybody came in after I said this, um, please make sure to share your role in the food system in the chat and also make sure to uh, choose a language channel, either English or Spanish at the bottom of your screen so that you can hear everything that's going on in the meeting. Um, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement We'll hear an update from the Food Policy Council Governance Circle and specifically Kia. And um, we'll do a little bit of framing of the conversation we're gonna have today. Then we'll hear from our presenters um, and then we'll do a breakout acti group activity and we'll come back together for a close. So starting with the land acknowledgement, please forgive me for reading off my slide here and you're all welcome to read along with the words here on the screen. So this is the land acknowledgement for the contemporary Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden counties region. We want to acknowledge that we are benefiting from land that has been seized, expropriated, and stolen from indigenous peoples. For thousands of years, this has been Pecumtec land. This is still the homelands of the Pecumtec, Narwadic, Warrenoko, Agawam, Nipmuc, and Abenaki. These native peoples and their descendants are still living here among us. Every time we gather here, we must acknowledge and respect that fact. Okay, thank you. So we are uh, going to talk a little bit first about um, what is the Hampshire County Food Policy Council? Um, some of you maybe have never heard of it before. This is the first learning circle of the Hampshire County Food Policy Council. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about our, our thinking behind that. Um, but first I'll just say the Hampshire County Food Policy Council um, is being established with a grant from the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. And that's called the Mass Up Grant. And um, we have several initiating partners um, who are, are involved in this grant and are, yeah. Okay. Okay, 
Are other folks having trouble hearing me? Can you type in the chat if you're having trouble hearing me? Kelly, you might also have to um, type that question into the chat if. Um, okay. In case people can hear you at all. Okay. It looks like most people can hear me. Um, I'll just ask again if anybody is not on mute to please mute yourself just to reduce background noise and maybe that will improve Catherine's ability to hear me. Catherine, can you hear me now? Okay, great. All right, and thank you, Catherine, for being our interpreter today. It's so helpful, um, and, and we'll try to get this uh, done in a way that enables you to do your job. So going back to the Hampshire County Food Policy Council, um, essentially, the, these partners had the opportunity to apply for a grant from the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. And we've had a goal um, of Healthy Hampshire and other partners in Hampshire County have had a goal of establishing a, a food policy council since 2017. And so we took this opportunity um, to respond to that grant and um, to look at how we can actually launch this council. Um, and so Cooley Dickinson is the lead applicant on the grant. And then also partnering to launch the council is Healthy Hampshire from the Collaborative for Educational Services. The Hampshire County Food Policy Council Governance Circle, which is the group that's working on developing a governance structure for the Hampshire County Food Policy Council. So it's sort of a proceeder to the Food Policy Council. Um, the Hilltown Community Health Center and Hilltown Community Development. And once again, just big thanks to the Health Policy Commission for the funding for this project. So from there, I am going to hand it over to Kia um, to share an update from the Food Policy Council Governance Circle. Kia, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, okay. Should, should I um, re-describe what our purpose is and then give the update or just give the update? Yeah, I think um, there are a bunch of new folks in the room. So hearing again about what the governance circle is will probably be really helpful. Alrighty then. Okay, so um, the governance circle is, we were set up to create and propose structure and guidelines for decision-making based on consensus rather than a majority. The purpose of consensus is to make sure that all food policy council members are heard and have input in decisions. So we're trying to create a cooperative environment as opposed to a democratic one. Um, we are thinking of conducting meetings loosely based on the sociocracy model, which we're currently testing in the group. Um, and I would, and we're also thinking about streamlining it for a larger group. And so we've spent the past couple of months sort of testing that model and seeing how it works with, um, I think we're currently eight people or something close to that. And uh, as we're getting to know each other and as consensus building is something we've been practicing, it, it seems to me and to the rest of us, I believe to be something that's, um, that's working out. I mean, I think we all like it. So I, I think within the next week or so, um, we'll probably be able to make a proposal to the whole group and uh, come up with um, a specific model for how we're going to govern our, ourselves. But it, it's taken some time, you know, it's taken some time and we've really hashed it out and thought about it and talked about it. And we've had helping circles to kind of narrow the focus in some places and make some, some smaller decisions and then bring it to the larger group. And, and that's where we're at now is um, about a week away, maybe two weeks away from, from making that decision. So. So this is very exciting. And I think once the, once the structure is up and running and the Food Policy Council is using that structure, it, it will be really easy to, to find consensus and common ground and, and be able to decide together, you know, what are the important issues we want to tackle, um, how we want to tackle them, um, what we want to tackle first, what are the most urgent concerns, like all of these things we can talk about and have consensus about all of it. So, so that's, 
that's pretty much where we're at right now. So we're making good progress and um, I'm very excited that things are actually happening. Thank you so much, Kia. Really appreciate that update, um, that detailed and helpful update. It's um, awesome of you to share. And um, I wonder maybe if we could just, um, if anybody has questions for Kia about her update, if you could send a message to her in the chat, Kia, would that be okay? Yeah, okay. So if you have questions for Kia, send her a message in the chat and um, hopefully she can answer the questions for you. All right, I'm gonna move on here. All right, so uh -huh. I'm just pausing here to get our, our interpretation figured out. We do have someone on the Spanish channel now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine, but she can hear now? Okay, great. Hola, Johanny. Bienvenida. Hola, ¿cómo está? <laughs> okay, great. And Catherine, um, could you please ask Johanny? Great, she's already muted herself, so no worries. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Glad we're getting this figured out. So um, I, so you might be interested to hear more about the Hampshire County Food Policy Council, and there's a way that you can do that. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a second because I want to put in the chat this link to our um, survey. So, um, see, okay. So that is a link to the survey that you can fill out if you are not yet receiving emails, if you haven't received any emails about the Hampshire County Food Policy Council, you can fill out that survey and that's how you'll get on our email list. So that's really important to do if you want to stay in the loop. And let me start sharing my screen again. Um, and so I will now move into the purpose that brings us together today. And I just, before I go into this, I just wanna share a little bit about what our intent is with these learning circles. Um, so we, we essentially, as you heard from Kia, have this group meeting right now that's thinking about how will the Food Policy Council govern itself? And so that group is doing its work um, and figuring out some really important things that are gonna be really helpful um, and we had an information session in October for people to learn a little bit more about the Food Policy Council. And we wanted to, one, keep the momentum up so that there are opportunities for people to stay engaged while the governance circle is completing its work. And um, before we start meeting in earnest as a food policy council and really start using this governance structure that the um, governance circle is developing. And at the same time, it's a great opportunity to um, just deepen our learning together about topics that I think um, will be really important to this work. So the topic that we are addressing today is about around transforming white supremacy in the food system. And I wanted to start with this opening activity. Um, so first, I'm just gonna ask you to think about a feeling or a belief you used to hold about race that you no longer hold. So you could just take a minute and think about what that might be you might be, uh, you know, kind of searching and 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 thinking about several different examples um, in your brain. And so, I encourage you to just sort of settle on one, um, even if it doesn't feel like the best example. If you've got something coming up for you, I encourage you to just settle on that. Um, this is a, a conversation about transformation. So, what I want to highlight here is the fact that. Sometimes we have thoughts or beliefs 
um, or feelings that transform over time. And so when we're talking about a, a feeling or a belief that you used to hold about race, when you think about that now, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel pride? Does it make you feel shame? Does it make you feel closed off? Like you just wanna go somewhere else? Does it make you feel hopeful? Um, so thinking about that feeling or belief you used to hold and, and, and feeling into how it, it makes you feel to think about that now, um, if you feel comfortable, um, could you please share your response in the chat? I'm just stopping my share for a second here so I can see the chat. And it looks like um, the word, the link that I posted in the chat um, didn't quite work for some folks. So let me see if I can do that again. I'll post a longer link this time, but this link should be able to take you right there to the survey. So I'm seeing several different emotions that people are experiencing from doing this opening activity. I'm seeing um, hopeful, I'm seeing, uh, let's see overwhelmed. I'm seeing um, thankful, hopeful. Great. Feelings of naivety. Yeah, Johanny is welcome to. Orgulloso, esperanzado. Great. So I'm seeing anger. Um, I think I heard Johanny talking about pride. Um, we'll see. We'll see what Catherine types in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for engaging in this activity. I know this is these are private, um, you know, vulnerable feelings. And so if you didn't feel comfortable typing in the chat, um, that's totally fine. And I encourage you to just um, continue to kind of hold that experience and think about that experience as you move through the learning circle today. So going back to my presentation here, and please do feel uh, free to continue typing your responses in the chat. Um, so we are going to talk about why we are using the words white supremacy um, to have this conversation and in the title of this session. Um, and I apologize um, for these, for me, what are, are slightly triggering um, images on the left which might be images that come to mind for you when you hear the words white supremacy. Um, and what I want to encourage us to do today is shift our thinking about white supremacy from uh, the idea of beliefs that individual people hold to a system that has been upheld um, over time. So when we're talking about white supremacy, we're not necessarily talking about the KKK or specific hate groups. 
we're talking about a system. Um, and that's what that graph on the right represents. I will return to a similar graph later. Um, so this is a timeline that I've put together to showcase how long it has been or how long it was that the concept of whiteness came into play in our country and then was used to systematically and legally suppress people who were not white and particularly people who were African-American, black, enslaved. Sure, yeah. So this is just a timeline to show um, the history of oppression um, of non-white people in this country at, starting from the invention of whiteness as a, con a concept. And I want to really hit home the idea that whiteness is an invented concept. It's, a social, it's what we call a social construct. So going back 400 years, um, almost to the year, um, enslaved Africans were brought to this country in 1619. And I think you all probably know what the purpose of that was. I don't need to get into that too much. It wasn't actually until the 1680s that there's the first written record of white as a race. So even though in this country between 1619 and 1680, we had these two groups that we now think of as white and black. There were over 60 years there that nobody identified them that way. Um, and so it was really in the 1680s that whiteness was invented. So going from 1680 to 1865, that is nearly 200 years of enslavement of Africans who were brought to this country as slaves. And so that's 200 years right there that whiteness was used to justify the suppression, oppression, enslavement of people in this country and that was legal to do. So just because slavery wasn't over doesn't mean that the legality of, of race-based oppression, and remember race being a social construct, was, uh, was over because then between 1877 and 1965, we saw the Jim Crow era. And so many of you probably know the Jim Crow era, era was a period of American history when um, resources were segregated between black people and white people and black people were only allowed to engage with certain resources and white people were only you know, allowed to engage with certain resources. Um, it was a period of enforced segregation, legal segregation. So I took this timeline up to 1974 with the end of redlining. And redlining, again, some of you may know was a practice that made it legal for banks to deny, deny mortgages in neighborhoods that were predominantly black neighborhoods. And so what I'm intending to show here is the long, long period in our American history where whiteness was invented and was legalized, a legal, uh, le it was legal to use whiteness to oppress and suppress people. And I, 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 like I said, I ended this timeline in 1974. Um, and I know probably many of you in this room can think of other examples of the legal use of race as a tool of oppression that happened in this timeline. And that's still happening today. Some of you might be familiar with Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which argues that drug laws are a new form. Michelle Alexander, um, who argues that drug laws are a new, a new form of um, Jim Crow era policies. Um, so, and please, I see that there's conversation happening in the chat in reaction to this. And so please feel free to share, you know, any other information that feels important to you to contribute to this picture, to this timeline, to understand it. 
So again, I'm going to apologize for reading off my slides here, um, but there are just some people who talk about this much more eloquently than I do. Um, and so many of you might be familiar with Robin D'Angelo. She wrote a really well-known book called uh, White Fragility, among other things. And for a time, she was also a professor at Westfield State here in Western Massachusetts. Um, and I, I'm hearing some background noise, so just a reminder to folks to mute yourself um, unless you are have the opportunity to speak, which you will uh, in the breakout groups. So in the words of Robin D'Angelo, while white supremacy has shaped Western political thought for hundreds of years, it is rarely named. In this way, white supremacy is rendered invisible while other political systems socialism, capitalism, fascism, are identified and studied. In fact, much of its power is drawn from its invisibility, the taken for granted aspects of white superiority that underwrite all other political and social contracts. White resistance to the term white supremacy prevents us from examining this system. If we can't identify it, we can't interrupt it. So this quote was really powerful to me, and I wanted to share this graph that I think demonstrates really well what Robin D'Angelo is talking about. This is a graph, for, a graph from a report called the Groundwater Approach, and the argument that that report makes is that if you have a lake behind your house and you find a dead fish in it, you might investigate what happened to the fish. Why was the fish sick? Why did the fish die? If you have all of the uh, fish in the lake die, the lake behind your house, you might wonder what's wrong with my lake. And then if all the fish in all the lakes in your area uh, die, you might wonder what's wrong with the groundwater. And so this graph, is showing the likelihood of having a bad outcome for African-Americans compared to whites in the US. And the red line represents African-Americans, the black line represents whites hold as a, held as a control group. And I know it's really tiny and hard to see, but this graph demonstrates how, um, how these bad outcomes span several different categories. So you have infant death, you have below proficient in fourth grade, you have searched on a routine traffic stop, you have in foster care, denied a loan, not owning a home. Um, and so what this is intending to show is across these different categories, health, education, um, criminal justice, um, child welfare, economic and financial. Yeah. So what this graph is intending to show is that across these different categories, including health, education, criminal justice, child welfare, um, and economic and financial categories, there's a higher and sometimes much higher likelihood of African-Americans having a bad outcome. And so this is what I think Robin D'Angelo is talking about when she talks about this, this, this culture, this system that underwrites every single one of these other systems um, and that we, we, we can't ignore if we want to think about how to um, change or influence these systems. So the other quote that I found really powerful when I was uh, looking for ways to express this is this quote by Scott Woods, which says, it's not a cold that you can get over. There is no anti-racist certification class. It's a set of socioeconomic traps and cultural values that are fired up every time we interact with the world. It is a thing you have to keep scooping out of the boat of your life to keep from drowning in it. I just want to pause there um, and take a somatic pause because when I read that quote, it really impacted me. Um, and I'm imagining that some of you might feel really impacted right now too. So I want to ask you to focus your attention on how you're feeling in your body. 
where are you feeling sensations in your body? What do those sensations tell you? If you want to share any of those answers in the chat, please feel free to do so. Sí. Bueno, un poco, porque fue que me tuve que parar porque ah, eso so era computadora, pero estaba cocinando, me parece que se me Definitely. Thank you to those who are sharing your somatic experiences in the chat. Um, once again, I know this is vulnerable. It can be hard to talk about um, our feelings in a large group like this. And so I really appreciate um, those of you who are putting yourself out there and, and sharing your feelings in this way. So I'm going to move us on. And just once again, ask you to think about this conversation being about transformation. We're talking about transforming white supremacy in the food system. And so keep thinking about this concept of transformation, how you're feeling in your body. It'll probably transform as we hear from our speakers, as we go through the breakout group activity, as you go on about your day after the session is over even, and, and think about what we talked about in the session. So I just wanna ask you to try to observe these sensations without attachment, to think about what information these sensations are giving you, and to remember that healing is a type of trans uh, transformation. So as you're experiencing these sensations, think about what makes you feel healed and where you feel like you might still need some healing and try to just observe that um, without too much attachment. So another thing I just want to name about this session is that I am intentionally um, taking an asset-based approach in the framing of this session. So we just heard about a lot of challenges that uh, revolve around this concept of white supremacy. But I want us to take an asset-based approach to thinking about how to address those challenges. So an asset-based approach builds on our individual and shared strengths celebrates what we already have and encourages us to, us to think about how to multiply or develop the strengths that already exist. And it was with that in mind that I invited our speakers here today. Um, and our first speaker is Amy Francis from Belly of the Beast. And so I am going to turn it over to Amy. Would you like me to stop sharing my screen, Amy? That's, that's okay. Either, either way, I was just looking for the mute button. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is, this is all um, such powerful work. And I, I really appreciate being invited into this space to talk about um, what our eatery uh, uh, has been working on since day one, but really probably has been working on even so much more so in the last um, eight or nine months. Um, talking about this and food and uh, all of those inter intersectional places. Um, so we opened the eatery with, um, <laughs> one might think it would be a damning concept um, because we wanted to use uh, whole animals. We wanted to use um, produce directly from farms in the area. Uh, we wanted to rely on our local food system that is so bountiful and, and fabulous here in the Valley um, and all of the farms that, that do such great work. And in doing that, um, we wanted to have a quick service 
uh, menu for a number of reasons, but one of that, one of the reasons was because we wanted to have people gain access to that quality of um, starting ingredients at a price point that was somewhat reasonable, um, which uh, has worked out <laughs> if we don't look at where we are right now with COVID. Um, the, the problem comes into play for me anyway when I keep thinking about these things because uh, while you can come into our eatery and probably spend $8 to get a really good nourishing uh, nutritious meal, you may not be able to have meat on that meal. Um, and for you to come in and try to spend $5 to have a full nourishing meal might be a challenge. So um, that's a hardship because uh, we want to be inclusionary. We want to be able to have everyone have access to uh, this wonderful food um, and really creating a community that way. Um, and yet we knew from the start, there was no way, we're not in competition with McDonald's, right? Um, we're so far from that, but for, for all the things that I might not value about McDonald's, at the end of the day, they are able to provide people with a very, very inexpensive meal. Um, so uh, so I, I kind of wanted to lay that as the groundwork because I think that, that when we're talking about race, for me, when, when I think about race and I'm talking about race, I, honestly, actually, I think I talk more about or I think more about the food and justice system and the parallels and gaps between being able to um, have people from all sorts of socioeconomic backgrounds within the same place. And therefore also in, in some ways that's to have people of different races in the, in the same places, but those aren't equal um, divisions, right? You can, <laughs> you can have like, way multicultural people in the same place that might all be in the same socioeconomic background um, and vice versa. Like those things can go in, in whatever type of waves. Um, but I think in, in my mind, sometimes they, they do have some parallels that, that run along. Um, so particularly in this year uh, with the, um, uh, with sort of the, reinvigoration of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and um, a, a reinvigoration of, I, and I identify as a white person, just FYI, um, a, a re, you know, invigoration of, of white people um, being both introspective to their own lives and introspective to our community. Um, uh, we really wanted to make sure that our platform and and what we do and where we stand was very clear to the rest of the community. Um, uh, part part of perhaps why that's so important is that Jesse and I both um, come from a Jewish heritage, and so in that background, um, uh, not not so much personally in, in my life. I've, I've, ha I've known times of um, being the odd one out, but I haven't necessarily had a moment in my life where I've felt like I'm an oppressed group in any way or, or anything like that. But I, I know that my family's history absolutely has that in, in spades, all the different stories that I've been told in growing up and, and Jesse as well. And so for us to be, um, white business owners in a small town that pride, Northampton is where the eatery is and where we live, that prides itself on being progressive and wanting to be inclusive and wanting to make sure that everybody has all their basic needs met and then some, we really wanted to use our platform to um, herald that and not just make it performative, but make it actionable like how how does that become actionable and how how do we do that um caitlin where am i on time you have 10 minutes 
Oh, great. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, uh, so in um, in thinking about how that happened, and also, um, <laughs> at, so at the same time that all this is happening, all of us experience this, right? At the same time that that uh, we're going through COVID and we're going through this reinsurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and rethinking about um, the lands that we that we live on that have been stolen from the indigenous people and how for 400 years this has all been happening over and over and over again. Um, we were also in this place where <laughs> communication is severely hampered, right? The only way that you're communicating with anyone <laughs> is digitally for the most part. Um, and us in particularly, we, um, uh, for the safety of ourselves and our staff, we weren't opening our doors. We weren't. We didn't ever do outdoor outdoor dining. Dining. We didn't ever do indoor dining. Um, so that even more severely limited our interaction on like a face to face basis. Um, how much people are having those anyway? Um, so really, it was through email and social media. Um, there was a time where Jesse decided on like the end of the, the emails that we sent out weekly, giving updates about our food. Um, we, he would be talking about, um, uh, he would be highlighting a um, black indigenous or person of color um, artistry. So usually it was, um, you know, writing or music or or film, he would kind of do a little write up to be like, hey, this is what I'm into right now. And this is what I'm looking at. And I want to share it with you. Um, and, and even from the, even from the start from when COVID happened, so immediately, when everything shut down so very quickly, um, we both have been a part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. So you get paired with a, um, with a a uh, child who, you know, is from the age of like eight to, I don't know, 16 or so, who wants to have a mentor type person that's not a parent, just in case you're not um, familiar with Big Brothers Big Sisters. In any case, both of us have been very much involved in that and so have a, a small pulse on, um, you know, the community and kind of teenagers and kids and that sort of thing. And immediately we thought of the, um, the, schools and the fact that like if schools are shutting down what is going to happen to all those meals that need to go out to children that need them um you know it's it's not just uh uh a thing that is helpful to the day it's a thing that's necessary for for their nutrition um in in the community so we immediately um reached out to the schools to see how we could help what they were doing how how that was happening in, in having the school shut down. And we were able to learn that we could supplement the meals. The meals were gonna to continue to happen, like it's a government mandate for them to happen. So that in some ways, like that's great. <laughs> Thank God the kids get to, get to eat and have the food they need. Um, but we wanted to supplement those meals and make sure that people who were losing their jobs, um, that families that needed and relied on those meals would have something extra either for the children or for the, um, parents or guardians uh, uh, getting that food. And so we quickly, um, I think it started on like March 19th. It was literally in the first week of things shutting down that we started making a hundred meals a week. Um, and basically that turned into doing a hundred meal meals a week on Thursdays. And so sometime, <laughs> sometime between like March and May, I kind of sat back and thought to myself, I don't know what we're running right now, but it's not really a restaurant anymore. Like, absolutely, we're serving. We still, we, we you know, stuck to our concept. We were still um, getting all the food from uh, local farms. We were still only bringing in uh, whole animals uh, and, and animals from, again, local um, uh, local farmers and everything like that. We were we were sticking to all of that and, and continuing to make food and, and deliver it out to people and make these meals and our social media and like kind of what we turned into. I was like, are we, are we running a nonprofit, but we're not a nonprofit? Like <laughs> what kind of is this? But there's, there's definitely something about how we wanted to really refocus on, um, 
how to dismantle white supremacy and all the things that uh, that go with that um, in our community at this pivotal moment where we're all looking at these things with a magnifying glass, hopefully we're looking at these things with magnifying glass um, because we're in this moment where so many people have become food insecure. And I, I hate to think about this, but I, but unless something really drastically changes for the better soon, so many more are going to um, be food insecure very, very shortly. Um, you know, unemployment uh, will, will run out towards the end of December. So um, yeah, so no, absolutely. I, thank you. Uh, during this pivotal moment where we, we are all looking at um, social justice and food justice issues with more of a magnifying glass than we did before, we just find it to be very important to, um, uh, to, to use our, our platform to refocus our community on, on those things and how to better, um, better manage, how to, how to better ma like dismantle white supremacy in our community and, um, and how we do that through our platform and with, and with food, um, which, is, which is difficult because this sort of circles back to what I said in the beginning, having a concept where you're going to lean on the community and take from your wonderful community buy all this food and, and, and reinvest that money to the farmers in the community and then turn that food into wonderful, you know, meals to serve to the community um, makes that food be at a price point that is not necessarily what we would want to, um, to do because then there's uh, a, a hindrance to who can access that food who can access our food, the meals that we make. Um, uh, and Caitlin, I'm sorry, again, am I about eight minutes? I was just gonna um, message you, you have about two more minutes. Okay, great. So so I'll just, I'll quickly sort of talk about where we've shifted in bringing in the I Collective, which is um, uh, basically at the end of the summer, I was burnt out from um, doing my job during COVID. So I uh, was in touch with a number of different chefs, but Neftali Duran, who lives in Holyoke and is an indigenous um, chef and uh, food justice activist, um, reached out to a group he's in called the I Collective, which is a group of North, um, North American indigenous uh, seed keepers, chefs, um, food activists, wonderful indigenous um, people who have now taken a residency at our eatery so that um, our platform can be used by, by them so that they can share their food and knowledge with the Valley. Um, and so wonderfully that has come about and has become a very real way of being able to, to hand over the reins and, and recenter. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Anyone who wants to be in touch with me can can email me. We can even plan a phone call um, if you want to talk about things more, have other ideas, anything like that. But I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Amy. Really appreciate you sharing um, about your experiences. And um, I see people are already dropping questions for Amy in the chat, which I think is great. And Amy, do you mind if people continue to ask questions through the chat? All right, awesome. Thanks so much. So to keep us moving along, I'll turn it over to Emily Chiara and Jupong Lin from the Common Share Food Co-op. Antes de que eh, eh, Katherine, pues me gustaría que tú me dijeras, ella, por ejemplo, la que estaba hablando, que yo lo que no supe de dónde ella, o sea, o, o de dónde, dónde ella, de dónde el trabajo que ella está diciendo, o lo que ella, todo lo que ella ha dicho, de dónde es. So it's Belly of the Beast restaurant in Northampton. Okay. 
Okay, thank All you. Right. So I think Emily is going to start us off. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to the slide when I do my part. Okay. Um, First of all, I just want to thank Amy again for, for sharing um, about all the amazing and important work that um, she and, and everyone at the Belly of the Beast and the Eye Collective are doing. Um, and yeah, so uh, my name is Emily. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Common Share Food Co-op um, that is coming to Amherst. Uh, and I thought before jumping into talking about the topic of the day, I thought I'd just give a brief overview as to who we are, what, what is the Common Share Food Co-op. Um, and in a nutshell, we are a, a growing um, full service grocery store and community space um, centered on food justice and local resilience, um, looking to open in Amherst. And um, we have, as of yesterday, 735 founding member owners and because of the way uh, co-ops develop, we need founding member owners um, to join the co-op before we can actually create the store. And so um, once we get to approximately a thousand member owners, then we can um, actually build the physical location. Um, and so right now our movement is really um, primarily in the hearts and minds of all of our member owners and our community members that are really hungry for food justice and more equitable access to healthy, local, um, culturally relevant food in the Amherst area. Uh, so that is something that is really lacking in the Amherst community. Um, Next slide. Um, you can keep that one up. Okay. That's okay. Thanks, Yupong. I'll just wait for you. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and also just a brief background, if you're not familiar with what a co-op is, a co-op is any business that is collectively owned and democratically governed by the people that use its services. So that could be anything from, in our case, a food co-op where community members are both shoppers and they also have a say in um, how the store is run democratically, or it could be a worker cooperative where the workers of the business are also owners of the, the, the store and they can um, uh, govern things as well. And so in our case, our co-op will be both um, community and worker owned. Um, so in, in thinking about the, this topic today of dismantling white supremacy in our local food system, um, I started to think a lot about the connections with uh, the cooperative movement um, and how the cooperative movement in particular is one that has been through several evolutions um, and has grown within and alongside racial and economic justice movements. Um, and the cooperative movement is not new to, to communities of color. Um, communities of color all across this country and around the world have a long history of using cooperative economics to build collective wealth um, and access resources that have been denied to them. Um, there are many examples of this from uh, farm and housing cooperatives like the, the Freedom Farm Cooperative started by Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, other examples of, of food co-ops that have been built in majority BIPOC communities and low-income neighborhoods where supermarket chains have decided it's not in their best interest to open there. And so, um, and, and because of other um, uh, systemically racist laws and regulations, um, uh, entire neighborhoods have been, um, have become uh, food apartheid neighborhoods. And so that's where you often see food co-ops um, springing up because it's a way for community members to develop food sovereignty for themselves um, and, and increase their own wealth and power. Um, and so I, I, we say that at the same time, um, our co-op has done a lot of um, thinking about how to grapple with the fact that today's image of a food co-op is usually 
um, and unfortunately very whitewashed. Um, actually, Xupong, I forgot to ask you to <laughs> go to the next slide. So these are the these are the seven cooperative principles that govern all co-ops. Um, actually, if you could go to the next one. Thanks so much, Yupang. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so as I was saying, the, the cooperative movement, or the image, I should say, of, of food co-ops today um, is unfortunately one that is often very whitewashed. Um, and people think of uh, these health food stores that have very expensive products and that don't feel welcoming and inclusive. Um, and that's something, that's an image that we, um, with our growing co-op are trying to um, understand how co-ops got to that point and how we can um, actively work against that so that we are not, um, we are not perpetuating that image and actively working against that. And, and that means educating ourselves um, and our, our board, um, our member owners and our and the general public about the diverse and rich history of the cooperative movement, um, as well as sharing um, the work and successes from other um, uh, startup co-op uh, organizations in places like uh, Dayton, Ohio, the Gem City Market, um, is a, an amazing uh, startup co-op that we've become close with. Um, and they're doing incredible work to, to uh, bring accessible, healthy food um, to their community. And, and also sharing the powerful work of the Detroit People's Food Co-op. Um, so we're trying to, to shift our platform to both share why Amherst in particular needs a co-op and why the cooperative movement is so important and so powerful in um, creating an alternative to capitalism and dismantling white supremacy. And that our, our board has also been um, working a lot to address um, or to acknowledge the fact that Amherst has a very deep racist history and, and a history of, of upholding institutionalized racism um, in a way that has caused segregation and a lack of access um, to large portions of our community. There, there are very few full service grocery stores in the Amherst community and transportation to the, the very few food access points is, is very limited. And, and so we are engaging in, in work with volunteers and, and, um, and starting to partner with like-minded organizations to try to understand um, the, the policies that have led uh, the, the current, that have led to the current lands, food landscape of Amherst and what we can do to address that um, and to build a store that is more accessible um, to as many people as possible. Um, and so, and, but not only are we trying to build a store that's accessible, we're also trying to um, address the fact that we need more uh, BIPOC leadership in our community. Um, our co-op is um, organizing in a majority white community. And um, we acknowledge that in order to, to truly fulfill our mission of, of being um, a store dedicated to, to food justice and local resilience and building an, an inclusive economy, um, that means that those with um, racial and economic privilege need to make space for um, BIPOC leadership. And um, 
our board is currently BIPOC led um, and um, six out of the nine board seats that we hold are reserved for people of color. Um, and over the past year, we've been engaging in a lot of, uh, sure, I was um, saying that we, we strongly uh, believe in the importance of um, uplifting BIPOC leadership in our co-op and our, our board that, that is currently governing our co-op um, is BIPOC led. And we, um, the makeup of our board is so that six out of the nine board seats are reserved for uh, people of color. What does BIPOC stand for? Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, BIPOC standing. Catherine, we, ca we hear you in Spanish on the English channel. Mm -hmm. No, uh, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, BIPOC standing for Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color. Um, and I'm seeing Caitlin saying we have five more minutes, and I want to leave time for Jupong to speak as well. Um, the last thing I'll say, if you don't mind jumping to the next slide, Jupong. Um, we, uh, in addition to uh, um, working to increase the amount of BIPOC leadership on our board um, and in our committees. We also um, recently um, reevaluated our payment options for uh, becoming a member owner. Um, and that includes uh, creating a, a free uh, member owner share for anyone who is self-identified BIPOC, regardless of income. Um, and that is because we, we truly value um, building a more inclusive um, store and an inclusive uh, cooperative community. And um, we can't do that if there are barriers um, of any sort to becoming uh, a member owner. And we, we really, we value um, voices and, and input uh, more than, than simply the economic, uh, than, than simply a membership fee. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to, to create more um, awareness about right now and try to raise more funds so that we can, um, we can fund more solidarity shares across our community, as well as get the word out about the fact that we have these, these shares and, um, and encourage people to, to get involved in our, in our co-op. And so I'll um, hand it over to Jupong. Okay, great. Um, so I know we only have a few minutes. So um, my part of the presentation is uh, was just to kind of highlight um, one of the ways that we are trying to build a, a case, build a public case for the co-op. Um, and um, Emily has spoken to some of those um, rationales. Um, I wanna focus on um, framing food justice as a public health issue, as a public health crisis. Um, and I'm an artist, so I, I like to draw on visuals and, um, and artists um, who are doing work on food justice. So this uh, image that you're seeing is, uh, is an art piece by David Bradley. He made a few of these that are actually um, pretty large squares uh, or rectangles um, printed with these kinds of images. So if we were in a class, and um, by the way, um, these images, uh, was there a question? Okay. Um, these slides are um, the beginning of a curriculum that I'm creating for um, probably high school, middle age, uh, middle school to high school uh, curriculum about food justice and food sovereignty. So if we were in a class, I would ask students um, 
what looks familiar about this image and what is looks unfamiliar and then we would kind of deconstruct what this image is saying so of course many of you would recognize that this is the land of lakes it's a it's a, a parody of the land of lakes butter and instead he's um, put bitter blacklisting at the bottom and made the um, image look like uh, like currency, like a dollar bill. So, you know, uh, um, addressing the ways that um, corp the corporate um, industry, food industry um, has monetized our food and uh, much of the food that is produced is in fact fake food, it's not really food. Okay, I'm going to go move ahead now to, um, so part of this uh, curriculum begins with understanding these terms, food apartheid versus food justice. And um, I wanted to highlight Karen Washington's um, thinking around this. Karen Washington is a food justice activist. And she says that people in the hood have never used the term food desert, right? That's probably a term you've heard. Um, we at the co-op have learned that um, there are parts of Amherst that are um, de um, designated as food deserts by the, um, is it the FDA? <laughs> by the government that uh, certain parts of Amherst have been designated as food deserts. Rather than calling these areas food deserts, I would um, go with Karen Washington's um, expression or terminology, which is to call these areas food apartheid, because the term food apartheid puts our attention on the whole food system and the ways that white supremacy and racism, um, geography, economics, these are all interrelated um, forms of oppression. And so people like Karen Washington and LaDonna Redmond um, are really trying to build community resilience through things like um, urban gardening, um, food. Uh, Karen Washington is the founder of, um, I think it's called Black Farmers and Urban Gardeners. And, um, and I just love this image where you know, their, the community's urban garden is taking over um, the big M. <laughs> um, so food, what is food sovereignty? It's the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And so earlier when um, Amy was talking about belly of the beast and what a wonderful food system we have here in the valley, um, it is very true. We have a lot of abundance and a, a wonderful food system for many of us, but there are many people in the valley who, um, who don't have access to the wonderful um, foods of the valley. Um, and who, who don't have food security and who um, don't have food sovereignty. Um, in this slide, I wanted to highlight um, Karen Washington's call to us to remember that food sovereignty was a term that was coined by Via Campesina, which was a peasant, is a peasant um, farm um, organization or movement, and, um, and that she asks us to really honor that this term came from those roots, from people who have been fighting for land ownership and for resiliency um, for a long, long time. Um, she talks about how the term food sovereignty and food justice are terms that have been co-opted or appropriated um, just as food co-ops have, you know, as, as Emily spoke to earlier, the image that a lot of people have of food co-ops is that they're very white spaces. And, um, and I mean, I just went to River Valley the other day and, you know, 
every time I go there, I walk out shocked <laughs> by how much the the how much I had to pay. So um, so we're working really hard to make um, our our food co-op um, a different kind of system and to to reclaim um, cooperative economics from um, this tendency that capitalism has to constantly co-opt, um, you know, radical uh, movements. Um, I just love that this, they, the Black farmers and urban gardeners have a conference every year and they call themselves bugs. <laughs> so this is the bugs conference. Um, and also these images um, just really, um, you know, feed my soul which I think is something we're trying to do at the co-op even before we're able to open the store. Um, we, we really want to, to connect with community and, um, you know, and, and in our community check-ins, um, we're really trying to feed each other's souls and, and um, feed the community, nourish the community. Um, uh, and then the next couple of slides I wanted to um, just um, focus in a little bit on indigenous food sovereignty um, as opposed Jupan? to kind of, yes, we're you out of time. You could, yeah, you could wrap up in a minute yeah. or so. Okay, yeah. yes, Thanks. I will try to do that. <laughs> um, so indigenous food, I'll just highlight in this slide um, that they say food is a gift from the creator, that food is sacred. And um, I just love that so much. And I, I think you know, again, if we were in the classroom, we would do uh, mindfulness eating exercise and, um, and, you know, look at this gorgeous corn. This is from um, Rowan White, who is the founder of Sierra Seeds. She's a seed um, saver, a seed rematriator. Um, she's been working on bringing back indigenous seeds to their homeland. Um, okay, and I'm just gonna, um, well, let me just go back to this for one second. Um, I just want to mention that I'm uh, working on a PhD and really have decided to focus on the environmental history of this area, uh, indigenous and environmental history. And so I've, I've recently um, read a, a pretty old history of Amherst that talks about um, how this land was the hunting grounds of um, the Nonatuck and the, and the Nipmuc. And it was sold, supposedly sold at a fair price to the native people. So of course, the, the next sentence was, um, you know, it, it was sold at a, at a rate that, um, you know, was far below what the real estate um, prices at the time would have called for. So basically the indigenous people of this area were cheated out of the land. And now we have this whole town um, where their presence and their history is invisible. So, um, so that's, you know, part of the work of the co-op is, uh, one of the principles of cooperatives is, is education, um, educating the community and creating learning spaces and um, that's what I, I'm trying to do with this um, curriculum to bring to light the, the history of genocide right here where we live um, and that our co-op is committed to um, rectifying the wrongs of the past. Thank you so much, Jupong and Emily. Really appreciate um, you sharing so much about the co-op. It's really great to hear all of the work you're involved in. Amy, too, um, so appreciate both of you sharing. Um, and once again, if you have questions for Jupong or Emily, I would encourage you to put them in the chat. Um, and I want to make sure we have time for our breakout rooms. Um, so this is the exercise we're going to do in our breakout rooms. Um, so this is the mass emotion leading with race and racism framework. And actually what I'm gonna do right now is um, put in the chat this slide, a link to where you can view this slide so that you can click on it and bring it up on your screen so that you have access to it when you're in the breakout room. Um, so this 
the Mass in Motion program is one of the programs that funds Healthy Hampshire, um, and this is a framework that that program uses and that we use in our work. Um, and so the Leading with Race and Racism framework focuses in these five areas. One is making changes to policies, systems, and, and the built environment, uh, working with many different partners who bring many different strategies and points of view to solving a problem, working with people who are most deeply affected by an issue to develop alternatives and solutions, thinking about who benefits, who's harmed, who influences, and who decides before deciding on a change strategy, and looking for the root causes of inequities in health outcomes. So going beyond that first sort of most obvious solution. So is this really an issue of education, people not knowing what to eat, for example, or is it an issue of people not having access to the food that they, they need? Um, and so what I would like you to do in the breakout groups is, um, once again, remember we're taking an asset-based approach here. So think about a group that you are involved in um, or some work that you're doing. And there will be three people roughly in your breakout group. And since we're a little short on time, I would recommend that you just pick one or two of these elements from the Leading with Race and Racism framework. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat again and talk about with your group mates um, how you are following these principles in your work. And so if that is clear, can I get a thumbs up from like at least some people to make sure it's clear? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna open the breakout rooms and hopefully everybody will end up with somebody else, but I know we've had some people coming and going so it might take a moment to adjust. I'll plan on having the breakout rooms open for about, oh my gosh, five minutes, which is totally not enough time. So maybe you can each choose one of the things from that list and talk about how you're doing it in your work. All right, here we go.